Hello, I'm Yalda Hakim. Welcome to the Sky News Daily. I'm here to present this special episode because in about a week's time, I've got a new program on Sky News called The World with Yalda Hakim. And we'll be looking at the biggest international stories nightly at 9 p.m. Uh, that's starting on January the 22nd. We'll definitely be talking about a range of global issues. And indeed, now this latest crisis, overnight airstrikes by the British and U.S. military on Houthi targets in Yemen. Rishi Sunak says the strikes are a proportionate response to attacks on world shipping in the Red Sea by the Houthis. But with the Houthis having the firm backing of Iran and support in much of the Arab world for their stated aim of attacking ships linked to Israel, this raises the stakes that the Israel-Gaza conflict could draw in other countries in the Middle East. To find out all you need to know about these strikes, why they've happened and what's at risk now, I have with me Deborah Haynes, Sky News Defence and Security Editor, and Alex Crawford, our special correspondent who has reported extensively on Yemen. Alex, I'm going to begin with you uh, because you've done uh, a huge amount of reporting out of Yemen. You've spent time with the Houthis. And I just want to go back to basics. Who are they and what have they been doing in the Red Sea? Well, the Houthis have been really making a name for themselves over the past 24, 48 hours. That is for sure. And uh, it seems to me that's exactly what they um, probably intended to do. I would describe them as a relatively militant religious extremist group that has grown in massively in stature over the last nine, 10 years. They started out as a sort of ragtag group of rebels who jumped on what was known as the Arab Spring in uh, 2011 to topple the dictator who had been in charge of Yemen for about 30 years. And as a result of that, they were relatively successful, but that had a knock-on effect. It started what led to a very divisive and bloody prolonged civil war, because one of the two big regional powers, Saudi Arabia, sort of stepped in when the Houthis started getting a bit too successful. Ten years later, they're still embroiled in this very bloody civil war that has led to what was one of the world's worst humanitarian crises for the Yemeni people. And during that time, the Houthis received a lot of backing, both militarily, uh, weapons-wise, intelligence-wise, political-wise, from the other regional superpower, uh, Iran, and Saudi Arabia gathered together a coalition to take them on, which involved Britain, America, United Arab Emirates. And they helped back the government, an internationally recognized government, which is still more or less running in the South. But the Houthis, they run uh, two thirds of the population. They control territorially huge swathes of the North and specifically a long section of the Red Sea coastline, uh, one of the, the most, if not the most important shipping route uh, in that area and perhaps globally. Their basis is rooted in being very anti-Israel and anti-America, and they inserted themselves into what was going on in Gaza, Palestine and Israel by basically saying that they would disrupt these shipping routes. And they have been pretty successful. They've attacked since the October the 7th Hamas attacks inside Israel. They've made nearly 30 attacks against key shipping routes. But more, more to the point, they've made it very difficult for ships to go through that key route, which carries 15, 20 percent of, uh, of the world's shipping. They've had to reroute, go around the Cape of Good Hope, costing lots of money and created an insecure situation, which will undoubtedly and has already had a knock on effect on the price of, of goods in, in supermarkets all over the world. And the US and UK have been spending the past few months Definitely, it's, it's increased over the past few weeks, warning that these attacks cannot go on until they painted themselves pretty much into a corner and they had to take action. Otherwise, they were going to look like they were making baseless, empty threats. It, it, that's certainly how many people have read it. 
Yeah, Alex, and I'm going to pick up on that point uh, that you've just made. Over and over again, the United States said, stop or we'll shoot. Stop or there'll be consequences. And Deborah, we saw some of those consequences overnight. Just tell us about how the United States-led coalition, Britain's involved in that, um, have uh, launched these targeted strikes late into last night going into this morning. Yeah, so they they did their warning, didn't they, on the 3rd of January, like stop or else. And the Houthis ignored that warning and launched this massive strike with drones and missiles on Tuesday, uh, including against a British ship uh, and the US says against US ships. So a a fight back was inevitable. And that's exactly what we've seen. Um, So we had from the US, they launched uh, jets off one of their aircraft carriers in the region. They also launched Tomahawk cruise missiles from the sea, from warships at sea, and also submarines. The UK has a much a much smaller but still potent military presence. They used jets operating out of an airbase in Cyprus. So four Typhoon jets supported by um, an air tanker refueling plane. Uh, it had to fly um, more than one and a half thousand miles to get to the target. These British jets were armed with precision guided Paveway 4 bombs, uh, which means that they had to actually fly into Yemeni airspace. They couldn't launch them from a distance. And then they went after two specific areas, which the British said were facilities used by the Houthis to launch drone and missile attacks. The British have said that, that they were successful, there wasn't collateral damage, and then the jets left. Interesting that they, they flew into Yemeni airspace. They clearly had intelligence to say that it would be safe to do so. They weren't worried about threats from the surface-to-air missiles. And then the Americans, all together with the British, they hit 16 sites, 60 different targets, launching more than 100 different missiles. The Houthis have said uh, that there were roughly about uh, 78 strikes. That's their statement. And in terms of collateral damage, they say that roughly about five people uh, were killed. The West has said the purpose of this was to uh, disrupt, degrade Houthi capabilities. Deborah, have they? That is the big question. And I think the problem you've got is that they can degrade, they can disrupt, but can they deter? And from everything you're hearing from the Houthis uh, in response to this attack, it's exactly what they wanted. They were almost baiting the West to come and have a go. President Joe Biden, the US president, he gave a statement last night after the attacks were launched in which he warned very specifically that if the Houthis continue to target shipping, then they will strike again. The UK, it's interesting, their response, their comments today have been a bit more muted. Uh, I've been speaking to sources that say that they hope that this attack will send the message and deal with the problem. One source said to me, we've sent a slap on the wrist or rather a smack in the face to the Houthis. And, uh, and you know, we're hoping that that will send the message and they will learn the lesson. I think that this is not the the beginning and the end. This is definitely just the start. And it will be really interesting and important to see what happens next. Yeah, I I mean, Alex, when we talk about and think about deterrence, uh, let's just talk a little bit about the mindset of the Houthis. This has done a hell of a lot for their brand, more so than at any other point in their history. We've talked about uh, their war with the Saudis. They feel that they won that war against the Saudis. And now... Now, they're standing up for the rights of the Palestinian people. And in many ways, they view themselves and certainly their branding is all about these messengers of God, the the partisans of of God. They're not going to be afraid of this, are they? Absolutely not. And in fact, we've seen just the immediate reaction on the streets of Sana is huge numbers of people coming out in support of what is being portrayed by the Houthis as a support of the Gazans and a support of the Palestinian people and in support of what they're suffering at the hands of the Israeli bombardment there. They're very clearly trying to link it, the Houthis that is, with the war in Gaza. Now, obviously the the facts seem to show that a number of these ships have, have got little or very little link with Israel. It's turned into the first ship that was attacked had a, a, an Israeli ownership connection, but since then it's been an attack against international shipping. But the Houthis are portraying it very much in the frame 
of this is part of taking on Israel, taking on big America, taking on the West, UK now, uh, in the, the fight to defend Palestine. And that ha resonates very, very deeply and clearly with the Yemenis. So many of the, uh, of the Yemenis, particularly those who've been under Houthi control in the north are not fans of the Houthis. The Houthis are extremely authoritarian. They've become stronger and stronger. They have a very poor human rights record, jailing journalists, uh, most recently when I was there last year, jailing YouTubers, TikTokers, feminists who in any way criticize them and jailed them for the, the ones in particular who criticize them for being corrupt, for instance, were jailed for between six months and three years whilst I was there. You know, talking to a human rights activist this morning who's in Sana, who heard the missiles coming in and the barrage uh, of, of attacks uh, landing in, in a number of places, Hudaydah and uh, Sana as well being amongst them. She said there's a lot of fear at first, a lot of anger towards America and Britain and confusion about their feelings towards the Houthis because, as I say, they're, they're not popular. They're, as a result of this war and their authoritarian rule, uh, there's large sections of the public service uh, who have not been paid, have not got any salaries, doctors, nurses, uh, public service workers who have not had any salaries since 2016. One of the world's worst humanitarian disasters. It's had the, one of the world's worst cholera outbreaks and the people are very poor. But this, unfortunately, is going to push them towards the Houthis. And as one human rights defender told me, in Yemen, there are no good guys. Stay with us because we're going to continue uh, to analyse and discuss uh, what's going to happen next with Deborah Haynes and Alex Crawford. Welcome back. I'm Yalda Hakim here on the Sky News Daily, and I'm still with Deborah and Alex. A lot of questions now about what this looks like going forward. You know, the United States and, and, and Britain say that, well, you know, this is a, a way to deter them, although U.S. officials have also said that we don't necessarily expect them to uh, stop. We expect it to, you know, maybe continue and we may have to re-strategize. And the question then, Deborah, is, is there a strategy? Do we know if there is a strategy? I think it's really important when we talk about this that, yes, the Houthis are framing all of this as they're attacking uh, ships in the Red Sea that are linked to Israel, claiming it's all about what's happening in Gaza and saying that this will continue until Israel ends its war there. But of course, there is a much bigger picture here too. It's Iran absolutely at the centre of all that's happening in that region. And from the UK and the US perspective, they 100% view this as Iranian meddling, exploiting the fact that there already is a huge crisis in the Middle East, stirring up more trouble, igniting new flashpoints. And so when you listen to the UK, the US, this coalition of countries that have come together to help to protect shipping in the Red Sea, and then this smaller grouping that have been involved in the military action, they are absolutely framing it as about protecting protecting global shipping and making the point that this isn't just the West um, taking a stand. This affects uh, Indian ships. It affects Chinese ships. It affects global shipping. It's a problem for everyone. And that's why you've had the UN Security Council, and we all know who's on there. They're not all friends, coming together and condemning the Houthi attacks. And so um, in terms of the strategy, uh, it, it's very much trying to, to, to separate this from being directly connected to the war in Gaza in terms of where the US, the UK and others in this coalition are coming from and also countries in the region, including Saudi Arabia, who do not want to see this war escalating, then the hope will be that significant military action, which is what happened overnight, this wasn't a small strike, this was a big collective action against multiple targets, as well as diplomacy, maybe pressure on Iran, because Iran clearly can have the key to turn this on and off effectively, would do something. And if it doesn't, then 
then we really are in a dangerous situation of escalation. And that's the point here, Alex, that the sort of miscalculations lead to escalations, which can lead to conflict. So let's talk about the role of Iran in this and, and just help us understand the relationship between Iran and Yemen. We talk about uh, the, the Houthis being a proxy of the Iranians, but it's much more nuanced and complicated than that, because while without Iranian support, without Iranian intelligence, without Iranian weaponry, the Houthis would not be where they are today. Certainly, they have come a long way in the last nine years in terms of their own power and, and abilities. And yet, they are in their own ways sort of fiercely independent as well. While they get much of their support from Iran, they're not direct proxies like, say, Hezbollah may be. That's exactly what I was going to say, actually, Yelda, that it's not the same relationship as with Hezbollah or even in many ways Hamas, both of whom have a lot of support and Hezbollah in particular very, very closely linked with Iran. Uh, the Houthis are, are different, a very different kettle of fish in, in that. Yes, they have definitely benefited from Iranian support. They have benefited in terms of what weaponry they have and would really rankle at being told that they take any orders or they have that their, their puppet masters are the Iranians. They would, they would take great exception to that. They believe that they, and in many cases, they are extremely independent of Iran. And then the, the worry for everyone else, including the Yemenis, is they may not be quite so easy to restrain or control or to guide as, for instance, Hezbollah, where the Hezbollah leadership, the political leaders, the military leaders have been much more contained. And most of the international community has been seeing this, this rise of tit for tat between Israel and and Hezbollah uh, the, the, in Lebanon, and it's been very, still very contained and controlled. The Houthis are very, very different. If you're moving around Yemen, the Houthis know about it. They know where you are, who you're talking to, where you're going. They have a, a big hold on the media channels. They have a big hold on any business links. They run everything, and they are very particular about not taking orders from anyone else outside the country. And as you pointed out, right now, the, the recent history, nine, 10 years, they've taken on some pretty tough opponents. They've taken on Saudi Arabia. They've taken on UK and USA, even UAE in, in some cases. And they can present themselves as having beaten these bigger, more powerful, big militaries. Now, that is extremely worrying for what happens now. And I just think that the, what the difference between what's happening in the tragedy of the civil war inside Yemen is that the actions that the Houthis are taking in the Red Sea in terms of you know, their, uh, and, and the justification for it is that they are only able to do this because of the support they're receiving from Iran in terms of the weapon systems that they're using. So these cruise missiles, these ballistic missiles, um, the drones that they're using and the intelligence that they're relying on in terms of targeting the ships. So in that way, um, it's the, the Iranian influence um, that's part of this bigger play. I guess many people, they probably would have wondered, well, why should I care about Yemen? Why should a small country, poor country like Yemen have such global ramifications? Somehow the United States, the West always get dragged in back to the Middle East. And if we could talk a little bit more about strategy, militarily, tactics, where this could go and how much things could escalate, because of course, that is exactly what they're trying to avoid here. The thing that's really important and the thing that makes what we're seeing so difficult to predict is that those the tectonic plates that hold our entire planet together are shifting. You know, since the end of the Second World War, when you had this rise of, of the democracies of the world, of the US, the UK, uh, you had NATO, a relatively effective Security Council, a relatively effective rules that favoured democratic countries and were deliberately designed to try to contain the power of authoritarian regimes uh, like the Soviet Union. That's all changing. In these last three or four decades of relative 
peace in the Western world, countries like the UK and others have just disinvested in uh, in our militaries. And so our capability to be able to enforce the rules that we want the world to follow has dwindled at the time when our our opponents, our foes, have heavily invested, including Iran, a huge builder now of drones, of missiles, at a scale that the UK um, could never match at the moment. And so that tips the balance of power. And it means that, yes, while America has come out, it had no choice. It had to act and attack these Houthi targets after the failure by the rebels to listen to these warnings. But the question you have to ask is, is American firepower enough to be able to deter a further escalation and a shifting in the balance of power? And, you know, nobody knows that. Well, lots of big questions there. Thank you so much, uh, Deborah and Alex, for all of your analysis there. That's it uh, from me, Yalda, here on the Sky News Daily. Don't forget to tune into my new show on Sky News at 9 p.m. on the 22nd of January. It's called The World with Yalda Hakim, where we'll be discussing all of these issues in the Middle East and more.